We live in a world full of stereotypes, some more benign than others. Being viewed through any stereotype sucks, but unfortunately it goes deeper than that. Knowing or being reminded of stereotypes for the different groups you belong to can impact your ability to do the very things that that stereotype is about. Let's talk about the science behind this. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to talk about stereotype threat. What is it? Who can experience it? What can be done about it? And we'll start by reviewing a review paper before going through a case study of what this can look like academically as well as recreationally before concluding with some recommendations for the gaming space. Let's begin at the beginning. Stereotype threat occurs when a person is concerned that they will be judged or treated unfairly because of a perceived stereotype that may apply to them. This results in extra pressure to avoid proving the stereotype correct, which can then unfortunately result in lower performance. This has been demonstrated in math class grades compared against what you would expect people to score based on their SAT scores for both minorities and women and stereotype threat can partially explain the race or gender gap in academics, particularly in the STEM fields. There's also evidence of this occurring outside the classroom. For example, stereotype threat can impact a person's ability to putt in golf, to drive a car safely, the list goes on. Every individual is potentially vulnerable to stereotype threat because every individual has at least one social identity that is targeted by a negative stereotype in some given situation. I don't think there's a person alive who wouldn't be able to have this quote applied to them in some way. Women can't drive. Older adults are forgetful. White men can't jump. An important piece for how much this will impact a person is the degree to which that they identify with the group being stereotyped. So other people may perceive this person as belonging to whatever group, but that doesn't matter so much here as how much that person feels like they belong to that group. We tend to be pretty sensitive to cues, potentially reminding us about different stereotypes that could apply to us in different settings. An example from the paper that resonated for me given my experience in undergrad is an imbalance in people relevant to the stereotype can trigger the stereotype threat, particularly in STEM classes. As I've mentioned in other videos, I went to a STEM school for undergrad. And to give you an idea of the gender disparity that was there, there was an unofficial saying among the women, particularly the single ones. The odds are good, but the goods are odd. We'll talk about this more later on. To get back to the point here, the stereotype cues don't have to be blatant. Like the professor saying, women suck at math. They can be much more subtle and still screw with you. The takeaway here is that these stereotype cues don't have to be directly targeting you or even an obvious environmental factor for you to be potentially impacted by them. Because these are so plentiful, to demonstrate them in controlled laboratory settings, the typical approach is to reduce the impact of the threat. This means giving out a test with differing instructions. Some participants would be told it is a test of X, others would be told it is not a test of X. One experiment brought in both black and white students who were asked to share their SAT scores in addition to other demographic information. Some students were told the experiment's test was a diagnostic test of intellectual ability, others were told it was not that. The students who were told it wasn't an intellectual ability test scored comparably, controlling for SAT score, but the black students' test scores were lower in the presence of the intellectual ability instruction. Another experiment did something similar with gender and math tests and found comparable results. A key piece of jargon to know here is underperforming. The black students who performed worse than would have been expected by their SAT scores in the presence of the stereotype threat inducing instructions underperformed. Stereotype threat is a complex effect with many different factors affecting how a person will perform. This review paper focuses on three aspects of stereotype threat that can lead to underperformance. 
extra pressure to succeed, threats to self-integrity, and priming of stereotypes. The extra pressure to succeed comes into play with the person either wanting to disprove the stereotype or at least not lend credence to it. And this extra pressure isn't felt by people who are unaffected by this particular stereotype. But for those who are, this extra pressure can impact performance in a couple ways. First is the mere effort of trying to disconfirm the negative stereotype. What this roughly works out to is dumping extra mental resources into what are the automatic parts of the task. For example, reading is pretty automated for most adults. You don't have to really think about it, you just do it. And for easy versions of the task relevant to the stereotype, this works out well. But as you increase the difficulty, like with academic tests, you need to be able to allocate the resources to the more effortful controlled processes instead of the automatic ones, but this can be difficult to do. Along these same lines is the idea that physiological arousal may be heightened when under stereotype threat. And this is supported by the underperformance reducing when the heightened arousal can be linked to something not tied to the task, like a really annoying noise in the background. Second is working memory depletion. And we talked about working memory in a previous video, so if you need a refresher on that, check out that video. But the thing to keep in mind from that is that your working memory resources are limited. In Schmader's model for stereotype threat, the control processes that monitor errors kick into overdrive, which eats up a lot of working memory resources, which means there's less of those resources to actually do the task. Additionally, the need to suppress task unrelated thoughts can increase. So these would be those nasty little thoughts that can pop into mind that make you doubt yourself because of the stereotype, make you feel like you're going to fail, or other worries like that. Digging a little deeper into the controlled and automatic processing distinction, sometimes allocating resources to the controlled process can hurt performance. Topic for another day, but briefly, some of the things we do work better if we aren't actively thinking about them. A lot of motor programs, like shooting a basketball or even walking, work better if you aren't trying to explicitly control them. And you can actually throw off somebody's game or gate if you draw explicit attention to what they're doing. With regard to stereotype threat, for the typically automatic things that fall into the stereotype, the extra processing attention it's getting because a person's trying really hard not to match the stereotype can throw off their performance in a similar way. Second of the aspects that can lead to underperformance are self-integrity threats. These occur when the person engages in different behaviors to try and preserve their self-worth. This could be actively sabotaging oneself by not studying, not fully completing the test, or by trying to attribute the lower performance on things like stress. Basically, these are different ways that you can give yourself an out for not performing as well as you could have. Sadly, another form this can take is a person lowering their own expectations for how well they can do. We'll definitely touch on this one later. Lastly, stereotype priming can lead to underperformance. Priming, in a psychological context, occurs when you're exposed to one piece of information and other related bits of info get activated along with it. The classic example here is hearing something like nurse and related concepts like doctor are more mentally available. The performance effect of stereotype priming will depend on which side of the stereotype you're on. So if you're negatively described by the stereotype, priming of the negative concepts happen and you may see underperformance as a result. But if you aren't negatively impacted by the stereotype, so kind of almost positively impacted, you may experience stereotype lift, where you see better than expected performance. An example is men who are exposed to the stereotype that women do poorly on math tests tend to perform better on these math tests than would be expected from like their SAT scores. The gist of the consequences of stereotype threat on performance is that experiencing stereotype threat will drag down performance. It's a pretty robust effect. Many different types of performance can be impacted by this for many different groups where stereotypes exist. One paper found something interesting kind of hiding in the data. If you can reduce the amount of stereotype threat that people are experiencing, they may actually perform better than would be expected from their predictors. And this has been coined the latent ability effect and will be touched on later in this paper. There are individual differences in how impacted somebody will be by the stereotype threat. 
And a lot of this loops back to how strongly the person identifies with the group being stereotyped and the ability being tested. For example, if you care about your math ability, hearing that your group tends to score worse on math tests will tend to result in greater underperformance than if you are indifferent about your math ability. Likewise, if you are sensitive to the stigma associated with your group, you are at a greater risk of underperforming as mistakes you make magnify that stigma that you feel. There can be an interplay in group identities. One experiment demonstrated this by having Asian American women do math tests, and there was a difference in scores based on the instructions that they were given that primed different stereotypes. Asians are good at math, resulted in higher test scores, while women are bad at math, resulted in lower scores. So you have a roughly homogenous group of Asian American women presented with two different stereotypes leading to overperformance or underperformance. There are also differences in people's vulnerability to the extra pressure. People who are more motivated to succeed have a strong sense that they are responsible for what's going on in their life, or even have higher levels of testosterone are more likely to choke under the extra pressure. But people with better coping skills or who use humor to deal with things are less affected by stereotype threat. Experiencing stereotype threat is not pleasant, and as such, it may cause people to leave these situations or environments that are leading to these threats. It can also lead to people distancing themselves from that group identity to lessen the negative experiences. The example in the paper is women who are math-identified distancing themselves from the more feminine aspects of their personality so that they can push forward with their math interest. Or, like we talked about earlier, People may try to shift the blame off of themselves and onto other factors, like saying that that test was bullshit or this professor sucked. Affected people might also just withdraw from whatever domain, like math, physics, engineering, whatever, particularly if they don't feel like they belong with the other people there. The good news here is that if you can build a sense of belonging and community, you can lessen the impact of the stereotype threat and actually improve performance and retention in that domain. The consequences of stereotype threat on well-being aren't great. It can lead to an increased vulnerability to hypertension. It can lead one to choosing unhealthy behaviors like eating American fast food to assert one's Americanness, which would have negative consequences later on in life. So. Stereotype threat is something that can impact everyone and can even potentially be a health concern. What can we do about it? The bulk of the work focuses on interventions to reduce the effect of the stereotype threat, which have been broken down into three categories. The first intervention's approach is to try and have the person perceive the situation as less of a threat. The different test directions described previously, with it not being a test of whatever, would be an example of this. But seeing as how you're kind of being misleading about what the test actually is for, this doesn't really scale up well. A separate way to do this is to have the affected person think about their experiences or their group in a different way. For instance, the heightened state that they're feeling going into the test is because of a noise in the room and not the test itself. Or to think about the positive traits the relevant group identity has or overlapping characteristics between the different stereotype groups. Ways that don't seem quite so avoidant include encouraging people to think about the different groups they belong to or to focus on themselves and their strengths, as well as trying to view their performance as something that can change and grow over time. The second intervention approach is to build up helpful coping strategies. These can include learning how to suppress anxious thoughts, positive self-affirmation exercises, and mindfulness training, among others. The third intervention approach is to make the environment itself non-threatening. This is different from the other approaches in that it doesn't rely on the person learning how to deal with the stereotypes floating around, but instead focuses on making the environment itself more positive. In the research, this has largely been done by creating positive contact with members of the majority or minority group. There's also been work into building a positive view of the stereotype group, in this case building the idea that women are just as capable of engineering as men. This improved the engineering men's respect for their women colleagues. The authors emphasize that this is something everybody needs to work on, not just the people impacted by the stereotypes. They want research itself to scale up and have interventions rolled out on a larger scale. Caution is strongly urged for how college admissions are made, 
given the estimate that tests like the SAT probably suffer from underperformance for relevantly stereotyped groups. Educators and students are encouraged to try and implement the suggested interventions. Additionally, it's suggested that when a negative thought pops into head, to try and replace it with a neutral, or maybe even a positive or affirming thought. So, that's stereotype threat and the consequences it can have on mostly academic performance. Let's get into that case study now. Reading the papers for this video was sometimes like being read myself. In my Suffer Bus video, I briefly touched on the process of trying to work through the internalized misogyny I'd accumulated over the years. I was a bit of a tomboy growing up. I wanted the boy toys from McDonald's, not the girl toys. I resented being forced to play house at the babysitters. And I felt incredibly dejected when I was told by the boys that I couldn't play Ninja Turtles or Ghostbusters with them. And part of this was out of legitimate wants. I thought Barbie was incredibly lame and so would very much rather prefer the Transformer toy, thank you kindly. And I hate playing house to this day even, so I would much rather be off playing with the boys. But part of it was not wanting to fit the role that girls or even women had at the time. I wasn't even in school yet, and I was horrified by the prospect of settling down to have my 2.5 kids and be Susie Homemaker for the rest of my life. Combine all that with me testing into the gifted program in first grade, and my life path and choices make sense. And my parents were on board with me eschewing the social norms, probably in part because I was so academically driven. I never had to be bribed to do well in school. I knew I had to get good grades so I could get the PhD and not be a housefrau. And this became only more apparent as I grew up and realized that I would be funding my education myself. But I digress. When I hit puberty, and probably a little bit before then, my parents were worried that I would lose my academic drive because of boys. I'm not having to guess at this. I was explicitly told this at the end of fifth grade. Don't let boys distract you from your future. And part of this discussion was to not lower my expectations of what I could do to impress boys. Something that seemed to have happened to one of my friends from elementary school, so it was sort of a valid concern. To get back to my little internalized misogyny, this wasn't really an issue for me. I wasn't like other girls. I was good at the hard stuff. I was going to be an archaeologist, marine biologist, physicist, whatever. I was going to get that fucking PhD. To break the flow a second, one thing that bothered me in grad school was that a lot of the professors in my program had this expectation that students come in with a fully realized idea of what they wanted to pursue for their PhD, not some vague, I want to do cognitive psychology sense. And that's all well and good for people who are raised by at least one academic and have somebody to tell them what grad school's like and what it's like doing research in a field and all of it. Coming at this from a working class background and having no knowledge of any of this, it just all seemed incredibly classist to me. Anyways, as the paper would describe it, this distancing of the feminine that I had built into my personality may have helped insulate me from some of the stereotype threat I may have encountered earlier in life. At least until things got abstract. That all changed when I took algebra in 8th grade. I was having to work at a class for the first time in my life. Plus, my mood and anxiety disorders were really starting to come into their own, and we were trying to figure out the medication for those disorders, so I was struggling. My parents couldn't help me with the homework because it was beyond their knowledge base. My friends who could have potentially helped me, in retrospect, what they were doing would be called bullying, so no help was coming from there. So there's me. With a teacher, I was supposed to be helping out with his class, basically trying to tutor me through algebra. To say this was devastating to my self-concept would be an understatement. On one level, I was supposed to be gifted. I was supposed to be a smart one. How am I not understanding algebra, especially because it's only going to get harder from here? On another level, I felt like I was letting my gender down. In eighth fucking grade, 
the panic and the doom spirals I would fall into with the homework and even worse, the tests. It's a wonder I made it through that class at all. The situation sort of improved again in high school. Geology, biology, geometry, no problem. I struggled a bit with algebra too, but half of that class was playing card games, so just don't ask me to do anything with matrices and we'll pretend that I learned something. But then we hit the abstract classes again. Chemistry, physics, calculus. Now with the added factor that I was dating Dr. Mr. The Husband at that point, and he can just intuit a lot of this abstract stuff. But I persevered. I got through it. I even managed to graduate seventh in a class of like 700. I know, weird flex, whatever. My smarty smart, not like other girls, elitist self-concept was preserved. And then came undergrad, where I started out as a physics major. That first year in undergrad is not the proudest year of my life. Calculus wasn't making any more sense than it had in high school. And physics? We had a homework assignment due every Friday. Every Thursday, I was having a full-blown nervous breakdown. At one point, it was bad enough that I had to be talked out of chucking myself off of one of the dorm's balconies by my now husband. I was absolutely internalizing my perceived failure in these classes, and I need to emphasize the perceived. I got an A in that physics class and a B in calc. I don't know how, but I did. The not like other girls bullshit did nothing to reduce the feeling that I was letting down my gender by not being able to understand these classes. Looking back, I can say for certain that these anxiety and doom spirals that I would fall into absolutely ate into my working memory resources. I don't have to guess because that shit still happens to this day. I don't think I can program my way out of a wet cardboard box with instructions. Before committing to regularly oversharing on YouTube, I tried my hand at making apps. Despite being that kid in the intro CS lab who was having a breakdown in the corner because I couldn't get C to do the most basic thing. I took several online classes for making apps and some Java stuff and really tried to understand what was going on. But I was trying to make an app to help with studying psychology, and that required a skill set beyond what these classes and books could teach me. So once again, there's me, feeling like I'm confirming the stereotype that women are hopeless at programming and computers, which is then kicking off Meltdown N plus one of my life. In the phrasings of the review paper we covered, it would probably be safe to say that I am particularly stigma conscious. And maybe I would have been helped in undergrad if the classrooms hadn't been mostly guys and the professors mostly men. But that doesn't change the nasty little feeling that I am this dumb and incompetent and I am a disgrace to my gender. I can only hope this video catches somebody along a similar path before those sorts of thoughts entrench themselves because they can be hard to get rid of. Especially when you have the lobster daddies of the world running around spewing their sexist bullshit, but... That's a video for another day. Alrighty, time to ruin video games through the power of feminism. Just kidding. I'm not sitting here sweltering in an N7 sweater because I hate video games. I consider myself a gamer, and I've had plenty of my bad experiences over the years with different games I've played, but... We're going to focus on one that occurred over a stretch of time that ties in pretty well with Stereotype Threat. And it's not Mass Effect. I just... I love this series. I played World of Warcraft from launch up through Mists of Pandaria. I was in a raiding guild for most of that time. Raids, if you aren't a memorpiger, are activities that you cooperatively do with a bunch of people. Guilds are like in-game organizations to help facilitate progression in the game. The earlier expansions needed 40 people in a raid, later versions bumped it down to 10 or 25. In these groups, no matter the scale, there's roles. And if you're particularly crafty or well-equipped, you can kind of get around some of these, but for the most part, you need some of all of these. First, you need somebody to get smacked by whatever big thing you're trying to take down for its loot, and they tend to be pretty thick, but not doing so great in terms of damage output. These are called tanks. Then there's the people who can do a lot of damage output, but are a bit more squishy. 
Those in my day were called DPS. I don't know if that's what they're still referred to, but that's what we call them. And then there's the people whose job it is, is to keep everybody else alive because there's damage coming in from all over the place. Those are the healers. The roles have different features for what makes somebody good at that job. A good tank is able to take what's being dished at them by the big bad, which is usually very big and very bad, and also keep its attention so it doesn't go off and smash everybody else. A good healer is able to keep the group alive, at least those who aren't standing in fire for the millionth time. And good damage is able to do good damage. I would also add stay alive through the fight, but that's a philosophical orientation. This wasn't something that was a feature of vanilla WoW, so like when it first came out, but became more baked in as time went on. Uh, there were damage meters and healing meters. So these were sort of live scoreboards almost of how much damage or healing was being put out by the DPS and the healers. A complication with WoW and possibly other Memorbigas, I'm not sure, I only really played WoW, is that there's a sweet spot in when you need to push your next action button. Folding Ideas has a pretty good video on the history of WoW that goes into this in more detail, so check that out if you're curious. But basically, you need to push the next action button before it looks like you should be able to. There were also different character builds and playstyles that led to the optimum efficient damage for the different classes. And these were to the point where there was a set order that you were supposed to push the different attack buttons in order to get that most effective damage. And this was contingent on what debuffs were on the boss, what the environmental conditions were. So you can see how this would quickly turn into a sort of logic tree that you had to keep in your head for what button you should be pushing at any given point in time. I started out as DPS on a hunter, then a warlock, switched out to healing on a druid and then a shaman, before switching to a tank as a death knight, and then finally back to DPS on that death knight. And these changes were basically due to the needs of the different guilds I was in. And here's where we finally get to the stereotype threat. If you're on YouTube, it's probably safe to assume that you're familiar with the meme or the stereotype that women can't be gamers. And just as an observation, in the various guilds I was in, most of the women were healers. I'm not sure why that tended to work out that way, but that's how it was. So you've got me a person who is stigma conscious in a role with a bunch of other guys in a competition to see who has the biggest deeps. Like most people, I would like to think of myself as being a good player, but I rarely top the DPS charts. And I think part of this is due to a difference in opinion of what is important. I viewed surviving to the end of the fight to be on equal footing with doing damage, whereas other people who were DPS kind of threw themselves at the boss, did tons of damage, even if it killed them. In the context of some of the self-handicapping strategies we talked about earlier, I can't deny the possibility that my emphasis on survival was sort of a way for me to justify my lower damage output. Another part of my lower damage output was having trouble in the raids of finding that perfect timing sweet spot. I can still feel the physical cringe of me screwing up the timing yet again and watching my damage just drop on the meter. And that can become a bit of a positive feedback loop. You're afraid of screwing up the timing again, which means that you're more likely to either push the button early or late, which screws up that perfect timing. So now you're out of that perfect timing rhythm. So you're falling behind and you're aware you're falling behind. So you're trying really hard to make up lost ground which makes it more likely that you're going to screw up the timing again and fall even further behind and down you go. This also couples into eating up working memory resources and the automatic and controlled processing distinction. When I was in low pressure situations, I was able to find that rhythm without a problem. But in high pressure situations, like a raid with the damage meter, I was very aware of the rhythm and the timing and where I was on it, which would throw off the muscle memory I had developed for the things I needed to be doing and made it more likely that I would screw up the timing. But wait, it gets worse. This was in the Wrath of the Lich King expansion. I was playing a Death Knight. The legendary for the final dungeon was an axe that was perfect for Death Knights. 
In our guild, it came down to me and another death knight for who would get first dibs on making this axe, because it was a long, involved process. The other player got first dibs because their damage output was higher, making them a better player, even though their attendance was spotty. So, when they naturally disappeared again for a stretch of time, I was moved along the process of making this weapon. When this other death knight came back, finally, I was much further along in the process of completing this weapon than he was, so I was given preference in completing it first. This pissed him off. Royally. He threw a bit of a tantrum with the officers of the guild, which was sort of private, uh, but one of the officers was sort of friends and was more than happy to tell me everything that this guy was saying. Kinda wish he hadn't. So, when it became clear that this guy wasn't going to get his way, he quit playing WoW. Because of me. I eventually completed Shadowmourne, but couldn't really feel happy about it. Even to this day, I feel a stupid amount of shame about all of this. With the new weapon, my DPS went up by a bit, but not as much as the guy in charge of the physical DPS had expected. So, I started getting a lot of unsolicited coaching advice from the guy in charge of the physical DPS. I almost quit. I was because he suggested that I run a timed macro. All I'd have to do is push a button, and it would do the rest. It'd be fine, it would improve my damage, but why would I fucking play then? I'm just pushing a button and then not doing anything. I'm not playing, what's the point? Thankfully, this guy got busy at work and kind of wasn't able to play as much, so the unsolicited coaching stopped. And then the issue altogether was dropped when the next Death Knight completed his axe and didn't get a substantial jump in DPS either. That whole experience was the start of me not wanting to play where I can be observed by others. In part because I'm painfully self-conscious about people judging my ability to play, and also feeling like that is a reflection on my gender's ability to play video games, and I'm just reinforcing the stereotype that girls can't be gamers. Fast forward to now, and there were a handful of you who joined me on my Twitch experiment where I played Divinity 2 to see how it went. And the, to see how it went was to see how much I could deal with playing live in front of other people. The fact that I only did this once probably indicates about how well it went for me. If you've never live streamed anything, it's a pretty working memory intensive process. So you're doing whatever you're doing either conversation or playing a video game or whatever. So that's a fair bit of processing right there. And then there's interacting with the people who are joining you, which is fun, but it's another huge chunk of working memory going to that. Plus trying to keep it engaging or entertaining. And there's a lot there. Add on top of that, trying to play the game itself and all the bullshit stereotype threat I've got built into my head and it's too much for me. I can't do it. For this last part, let's go more broad than just my personal experiences. Women make up a sizable chunk of the people who play video games. However, this proportion is not reflected at the professional esports level. Part of this is certainly due to the toxic environment in a lot of the games that are played professionally especially towards people who aren't one of the guys. But given what we've covered for stereotype threat, I would argue that that's a factor for why there aren't more professional women or even non-binary players. The spectrum of weird to shitty behaviors some men can do when a fellow player is found out to not be a man, plus the negative thoughts and feelings that come from stereotype threat, could be incredibly off-putting when toying if this is something a person wants to pursue professionally. I have nothing but respect for the women who are forging their way into the eSports space. They likely are pretty resilient and possibly already engaging in some of the coping strategies suggested by the review paper. But as argued for in the paper, bringing women into eSports shouldn't lie solely on the women players' shoulders. The space needs to be more inclusive and welcoming, arguably for everyone, given how nasty some games have become but focus should also be given on building that positivity towards the non-men user base. Sponsors should be seeking out new talent more inclusively. If these changes happen, then more role models will probably emerge, which would hopefully help make the space more accepting and welcoming, 
which would then possibly encourage more women to venture into the space, and so on. And I know, arguing for something like this can seem a little silly, especially compared against trying to build inclusivity in STEM, but there are a lot of parallels, and a lot of people get recreation and enjoyment out of video games, to say nothing of the people trying to build a career out of it. So it would be nice if everybody could enjoy the video games that they want to play without it being tainted by the stereotype threat bullshit. And that's where we're going to leave this one. Until next time. Bye.